Michael Grinder. We are uh, doing our second of four webinars to advertise our Perception Camp that we're going to be having in Perth, Australia at the end of October. And this is our second in a series. We're going to give you a um, overview of uh, what we are going to be covering in the Perception Camp and in the four webinars. At any time you want, uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand and we can uh, entertain questions that come in. And then we recommend highly on our website, michaelgrinder.com, there is at the top of the home page a manual that you can click and that is downloadable so that you can uh, follow along with concepts we'll be covering tonight as well as preparing yourself for the program we'll have in October. I'm going to start off with a uh, overview of some information that we have pre-recorded that you think you'll find extremely helpful and this um, entire webinar it will be up on PowerPoint sorry on YouTube so that you can look at it at your leisure. Here is a pre-recording of the overview of the program and the book that it is based on. Enjoy. Hi Michael Grinder here talking about perception and we're going to have a perception camp Hi, Michael in Perth, Australia. Talking about perception. The dates are going to be and we're going to have a for the 25th of October. We want to show you an overview of the benefit of being schooled in perception. And the book we're going to go to is we're going to start off with Blink. You've either heard about it or you maybe you've even read it by Malcolm Gladwell. Blink talks about in the blink of an eye, you will make judgments about whatever you're seeing. So perception is what you see and what you hear and how you respond or how you interpret it. So perception is not just senses. It's your interpretation of those senses. Now, this is what Malcolm Gladwell says. He says, I'm writing this book for three reasons. The first is to convince you of a very simple fact that decisions are made very quickly and can be every bit as good as the decisions made cautiously and deliberately. Number two reason for writing this book. Our unconscious is a powerful force, but it is fallible. We, should we trust our senses? And when should we be weary of them? Answering that question is the second task of Blink. And the third task, and the most important task of the book, is to convince you that our snap judgments, our first impressions, can be educated and controlled. That's the purpose of our perception camp, is to talk about how to educate and control your first impressions. So this statue here is a symbol of a human torso. It's going to make a little noise as the Lazy Susan spins. You see there's a face in the gut of the human torso. So most of us, we make our judgments based on our gut feeling. But Malcolm is saying there's times when you can trust your gut and there's times when you can't. So perception camp is to educate your gut so that you have a high level of probability of being accurate in terms of your perception. Michael Grinder here, Perception Camp. That overview that you just saw will be on YouTube along with this entire webinar. So you get to review it at your leisure and share it with other people. We're now going to look at one other um, pre-recorded segment that goes into the three different levels that we have in perception. Michael Grinder here talking some more about Perception Camp. When you come to Perception Camp, you get to bring footage of different situations that you want to understand better. You can bring footage and say, I want to focus on one person. And if you do, then bring all your knowledge of psychology with you. NLP would certainly help in that area also. The book that we're going to recommend that you study ahead of time, and if you have it, bring, 
is called the elusive obvious. And it talks about nonverbals and how they, to some extent, reveal what's going on inside of a person. We want to respectfully understand what motivates a person, what is their perceptual filters, and what is their inspiration. Why do they get up in the morning? That's the first of three levels. The second one is we're going to look at two people interacting. And we want to understand how do we recognize which one is more likely to dominate. So when we're looking at one person, we're trying to say what motivates them. When we're looking at two people, who is likely to dominate? And we're going to use for that our book, Charisma, The Art of Relationships. And we're going to talk a lot about dogs and cats. Now, we have some mugs here to represent that. We have a dog and we have a cat. And they interact with each other all the time. For you, as you walk away, we want to make sure that you have a sense very clearly in any kind of a couple, whether it be a personal couple or a professional couple, usually between them, one of them is going to go more dog and one is going to go more cat. And that's the purpose of practicing and studying charisma. Remember, if you have this book, bring it with you to the camp. Then the last level that we have is when we talk about three or more people. And then we're talking about group dynamics. For that book, we're going to use managing groups, the fast track. So we have three levels, understanding the individual, understanding two people, and understanding many people. Each of those require a different set of studies. You will receive at the camp a manual that will show you when you're looking at your footage, how do you interpret an individual, two people, a group. Michael Grinder here, Perception Camp. So again, the three levels that you are interested in, see if you can figure out which one in particular. Is it the idea of one person and understanding what motivates them? Is it two people when they interact with each other? Is it several people? The reason why that's important is you get to bring two segments of footage that are up to three minutes long. They can go to four if you want. And what it is, is it allows you to say, Here's the footage of either one person, two people, or several. And I want to study it during the camp, and I want to sharpen my perception about one of those three levels. So be thinking about which level you're most interested in, and that's the kind of footage you want to bring. Now, where do you get the footage? You can do your family. You can do yourself. You can bring a segment from YouTube and even segments from movies. Pick the level that you like. Now, when you pick one person, the person could be in a scene with several, but there's just one person in particular that you want to point out. So it doesn't have to be an isolated person. It's just that there's a focus on one instead of the other people that are involved. The manual that we're going to be using is what we want to show you next, because by understanding the manual, and if you want pre-downloading it, you'll have a sense of what is the amount of content that we're going to be covering and how you can use it. So this is a picture of the Perception Camp manual. And you will notice that the table of contents will give you a quick overview that we look at the benefits, the professional development levels that we have, and then probably the biggest breakthrough we have is going to be our axioms that we talk about. And using video footage, we're going to give you all of these axioms. It's especially helpful when you're doing any kind of cross-cultural communication. You'll see that that first axiom there is that the baseline behaviors have to be known to understand communication. Last night, I just flew back from being in Russia. It was my first time in Russia, so I can't make sense a lot of what I was seeing but it's my first of hopefully at least 10 minimum trips so that I can watch and go, okay, this is what is going on and this is an accurate interpretation. My first visit, I would look at someone and a behavior and go, well, I know what that means only if I was back in my home country. So when you visit a foreign land, how do you figure out what's going on? Our axioms here help you. <clears throat> so if you want, 
look at this first axiom here, it's you have to understand what is the norm in terms of how do people look, how do people talk, and how do people move in a given culture. Then we'll go down to the different levels that we have here, and you're going to see that each of the different axioms that we have are the principles by which you interpret accurately what is going on. Now, go all the way to page 18, and you'll find some information that's extremely helpful. This is what we're going to be doing for this particular uh, month training, and that is how to understand one particular person. In trying to understand a person, there's different models that you can use to say, okay, let's look at it through the lens of this particular model. So the way I think about perception is it's like you're a miner that's underground and you have this light that is coming out in the front as you look over at reality, in this case, one other person. And then you put different slides in the light so that it illuminates different parts. So if you look up here in the very first one we have is we use the concept of uh, cats and dogs. We will use this also when we're looking at two people. So what are the behaviors that we're watching this person do? And based on that, can we do some guessing in terms of what motivates him? What are their beliefs? What is their perceptual filters? And what would be the best way to interact with that person so it makes the most efficient use of your time? We will also use the concept of visual auditory kinesthetic and there's a one-page paper, if you'd like, that we can send you ahead of time, as well as it being in the manual, that says, here's what visual-oriented people look like. And then we go into the idea of right brain, left brain. And that's really a cool and very easy way of watching someone. And let me stand up and show you one example of that. We'll have to adjust our camera. And it looks like this. If someone is standing here, and they're going to move in a given direction. As they get ready to move in that direction, what you want to notice is, do they turn their head before they turn their body? If they turn their head before they turn their body, that means that they're more visually oriented because they're seeing before they kinesthetically move. But if they move their body and then their eyes catch up, they're more right brain oriented or more kinesthetic. So the idea of right brain and left brain and visual and kinesthetic are almost synonymous. Then some of the other models we'll be using is the concept of concrete versus random and abstract and specific. If you're familiar, and most people in Australia have been acquainted with Myers-Briggs, please bring any profile you have on yourself or anyone else that you're going to be showing footage of. It's always helpful to verify what are the behavioral indicators of a model that is based on internal, if you want to call it, questionnaires such as Myers-Briggs. There's an old model that um, is not often used, and I just really love it, completely unscientific, and it has to do with being what's called choleric, sanguine, melancholy, and phlegmatic. Basically, it is a structure where you look at what is the intensity of the person's reaction and what is the durations of the person's reaction? So if they're very intense and the duration is very long, they're known as being choleric. Choleric people are usually your leaders. It's not just that they say something that they can fulfill it and they follow through. If you have very intense initial reaction but it doesn't last long, then that's called sanguine. And sanguine people are wonderful to be around in terms of high sociability, but you have to be careful in terms of them saying, I'll take care of that, because they may not. Then you have two other styles. These are low initial responses, and one has a long duration, and the other one has a short duration. The one that has low initial reaction, but a long duration, is called melancholy. Melancholy people... It's usually the temperament that is used by inventive people, people that like to create, and they just tinker. So they may not have a lot of initial reaction, but they're diligent. They work long hours, and they make sure that they fulfill whatever they set out to do. I actually come from more of a temperament of being a melancholy, 
and I've learned <clears throat> how to become more choleric as I form my own corporation. And then I had to not only do the inventing, but I had to make sure that I was given vision and motivating the people that are underneath me. Actually, you don't motivate people underneath you. You access their motivation and bring it to the surface. The last one we have is called phlegmatic. Phlegmatic is an unusual word, and it has to do with someone who has very low reaction and it doesn't last very long. It's a misnomer to use this to describe surfers. No, surfers have to do a lot of diligent self-discipline, and they have to be tremendously in shape to do that kind of activity. It's just that socially, they may not be interested in being highly ambitious in terms of the corporate world or succeeding in that arena. Then there's a concept from NLP that you may want to look at. It's called, it's called the meta model, and it has to do with are you drawn towards something or away from something? And towards and away from is something that's been in the news a lot in terms of how people train themselves when there's a crisis. When there's a crisis, most of us, we want to run because that's our natural instinct because there's some kind of a fear that we have. People that are trained as first responders, firefighters, police, they're trained themselves that when they see the danger, they move towards it. So towards and away from is a way of thinking about your adrenaline rush as well as are you motivated towards something or are you motivated not to uh, disappoint or do something poorly? Do you tend to go to big picture or do you tend to go to small picture, sometimes known as chunking size? And that's another set of um, templates that you can use when you are trying to figure out what motivates an individual. Two others. One is called associated or disassociated. A associated person is someone who's in touch with themselves. They normally are motivated because how they feel. So what they do, what they go forward and away from is based on how they uh, emotionally are responding to life. Whereas someone who's disassociated, they tend to operate above the neck and it's cognitive in terms of how they sort out life and what they're drawn to and drawn away from. The last one is uh, one that we made up that uh, we kind of like, um, partial towards it. Do the, does the person see themselves as a have or a have not? Have and have not can be uh, applied to any number of things. Are they have or have not in terms of money, education, social level, achievement? So if someone is a have, they see themselves as part of the inner circle. If they're a have not, they're on the outside and the way the outside people interact with the inside people is very, very different. Then one of the things you'll walk away with is that you'll have at least three characteristics for most of those models. I'm not uh, highly acquainted with Myers-Briggs, so if you are, bring your knowledge base and we'll share that with other people. And then the big thing is, instead of trying to take, say, uh, two of someone, and I'd really like to know what motivates you, what gets you up in the morning, how you respond to throughout your day. Would you please take this questionnaire and bring it back to me so I know what's going on? So instead of doing that, we're going to ask, can you figure out three external characteristics or motivators, indicators of this? Now, when you go to observe the person, you want to see if you can figure out at least one value, belief, style or filter, and then you're required working with other people and looking at your footage, what is the evidence that you can provide? We're going to do that for two other values. And then the big thing that we're going to be covering is what is the pentamental pattern that is present? The pentamental patterns is a description of the nonverbals that someone can exhibit at any one time. So where are their eyes focused? Uh, what is their voice pattern like? What is their body like? And how's their breathing? And that is the prerequisite for entering the perception camp. On our website, as well as Margot Halbert's Positive Pers uh, Persuasion in Australia, is a quick 21 different patterns of nonverbal communication. 
it is in a question and answer form. So you study it, make sure you know the answer, then you go ahead and submit the answer to the questions without the answers being present to me, and then I'll make sure I give you feedback on it. Everyone who's ever submitted has always passed. Now, after having done that, then the question becomes, what do you especially want Michael to observe? Now, the format that we have that is in your uh, registration that you receive once you've registered and is also in the manual is that we're going to show this footage three times. The first time, we're going to have you show it to everyone and we just watch. The second time, you and a couple other people have studied it, and you're going to be able to take your mouse, and with your mouse, you're going to stop the footage at any time you want and make comments on it. The third time we watch it, then I get to have the mouse and I stop it, what I can see. The difference between what you can see and what I can see is your perceptual growth. But you have to make sure that you have a sense of, as this green arrow indicates, what in particular do you want me to look at? And that goes back to our list that we had earlier here in terms of the different models. So in particular, if there's any of these models that you especially like, then make sure that uh, we're aware of that before we start showing the very first of the three footage, just so that we can be focused in on that. Now, at the end of this, you fill these out, and this is on page 18 and 19, is the section on just viewing one person. If you were going to say, no, I want to watch two people, then you'd go to page 20, Excuse us as we learn how to use this. So here's a checklist if you're watching two people. And our focus is going to be on who's likely to dominate. And again, you're going to have a whole series of questions. Remember, you're taking your footage, you're sharing it with two other people, and between uh, the three of you, you get ready for the second showing of the of the footage so that you can share that with other people what you have seen. Now the question becomes, excuse me just a second. So the question becomes, so what are you gonna watch for? You know, you're watching a person, you're saying, how do I know of all the things that I'm watching, say in a five minute footage or live with someone, what do I pay attention to? And one of the things that we recommend is that to increase your vocabulary so that when you're doing an observation, you have a sense of what it is that you really want to look at. And we're going back to our manual again, and we're going to show you at the very beginning of it some information that I think you'll find extremely helpful. At the end of the table of contents, it says that the average person is considered a settler. He or she only sees what they can actually describe. So your vocabulary limits what you're looking at. The pioneer is someone who actually can see beyond what most people can actually take in. And they have to create their own vocabulary to explain that. So we're suggesting very strongly that the idea of your vocabulary is going to greatly affect your ability to see what's going on. So the broader your set of words and terms and phrases are, the greater uh, number of situations you'll be able to analyze quite accurately in terms of what's going on. Now, there's a special place in this particular packet it's on page eight for those people that are going to download it. And we're going to recommend that you look at it first in the packet, and then we're going to show you 
a PowerPoint on it. And it has to do with this. Whether you're looking at one person, two people, or you're trying to look at several people, in order to really train your perception, to have an educated gut, as Malcolm Gladwell was saying, it's really important to understand how to use what we're going to call reality and how reality is very, very different than your interpretation of reality. And to show you that, we've put together a PowerPoint that is much more interactive than the static form that you have here on page eight. So let's go to that. So here's the same thing we have from page eight. And what it basically says is, if you make a distinction, and our distinction is based on this line, this line is what we're gonna call what separates the reality from the interpretation of reality. Reality we can see. We know what we occurred, and it comes in through our eyes and through our ears, Stay away from feeling. That's the gut that you haven't been trained yet to figure out what's going on. Now, as we see something happen in reality, we're going to call what happens in reality X. We immediately tend to go up and we start an interpretation. So as we go up and start an interpretation, make sure that you have a three possible interpretations of what's going on. So X happens. We want to make sure we understand X. And then we want to understand, okay, one possible reason why this occurred could be Y1. But make sure that you task yourself, what is something else that could occur? We're going to call that Y2. And then we're going to push you a little farther and say, see if you and your two partners can come up with Y3. Now, let's take, for instance, something down here. We'll pretend that we see a parent in public slap a child. And without hallucinating and saying that that's their child, just that there's an adult that slapped the child. We call the person a parent just because it looks like they're familiar with each other. Immediately, in order to hone your perception skills, make sure that you can ask yourself, what's one possible reason why the adult hit the child? Don't be satisfied with that. Make sure that you can come up with two other choices. So let's go back and pretend that this is the first choice. And we say, well, uh, the, the child was inappropriate. They were doing something that the parent didn't like at least based on the context that they were in. Okay, now force yourself. Uh, there was a bee or a bug on the child, and the um, parent wanted to get the bee or the bug off of the child. Force yourself, force yourself. That's a third possibility. Third possibility could be that um, they were having the hiccups, and the parent wanted to do a shock and make sure that the child uh, stepped out of their hiccups. Right, now that we have the three possibilities, we then say, okay, what do I do next? Well, the next thing you do is you say, okay, if Y1 was true, what would we see next in reality? So we go back down underneath the line of interpretation, say, okay, if it really was that the child was inappropriate, what would we see next? And if it was something that was a corrective or a disciplinary behavior, that behavior probably is very different than the next behavior that we could look at, which was when we had a bug or a bee on the child. And if we had a bug or a bee on the child, the behavior that we'd see here probably is very different than the behavior you'd see here. Again, force yourself to go to the third one and look at, okay, if it really was a hiccup 
and the parent was trying to shock the child out of the heat cups, what would we see here? Now, this habit of always taking a, something in reality, moving it up into the interpretation, make sure you have three possible interpretations, then take each interpretation, make sure you look at what would be the behavior that would follow it, and by having two, you end up having a dilemma. By the way, if you only have one, you're stuck. And that's why you have to, we all have to be careful because we read so many pop psychology books saying, oh, no, this means this. Well, you have to make sure that you have at least two choices in terms of interpreting that behavior and what would be the behaviors that would follow it. When you get to three, you now have freedom. One, you're stuck. Two, it's a dilemma. Three, you end up having the ability to say, well, all kinds of possibilities. By the way, this particular method, if you have permission with your partner in life, adult partner, is just a wonderful way to enjoy conversation without getting into arguments over interpretation. Example, let's go back to X. You've been at a party. Let's say we had relatives there, including in-laws. You get in the car and you start driving home. One says to the other, boy, did you ever see Aunt blah, blah, blah? And we'll call her Aunt Helenella. Did you ever see Aunt Helenella tonight? She was really, really in denial. Now, so the interpretation of Aunt Helenella's behavior is that she was really in denial. Now, if you have permission and the other party doesn't agree, invite whoever had the first interpretation. Would they be willing to just consider another interpretation. Now, if this second one is your interpretation, then together make sure both of you can come up with a third. So now you have three different sets of words to describe the same behavior that occurred. And that's the behavior in reality. Now, if one likes the idea of denial, what would we see next in reality, including not just for that particular party, but the next time you're around Aunt Helenella? If you disagreed with that and you thought that Aunt Helenella was just being aggressive and standing up for her rights, what would we see next in reality if that was true? Here's the most important part. If you only have two, if you only have two interpretations, then as a couple you fight. But if you can come up with a third, and if you, especially if you can do it jointly, now you have three different possibilities. Now here to me is what's uh, interesting and insightful from a social uh, science viewpoint. If the behavior that we would say would happen next, if the first interpretation of denial was there, if that behavior is no different than the other two behaviors, then all you're doing is you're just fighting over semantics. But if there is a difference in the behavior between all three, Whoever has the behavior that occurs after X occurs, then most likely the interpretive words that were used to describe that behavior is very useful. So the usefulness of hallucinations is that as long as you have three possible hallucinations, each of the hallucinations have three different behaviors that we can assign to the three possibilities. Whichever one predicts what is likely to happen, that's the single most valuable hallucination that you have. So if you would, think of something that has happened recently in terms of a behavior you did or someone else did. You can either look at an external behavior and say, you know, here's what's going on inside. Or you can uh, jump right in and say, you know, this person has a behavior of, a temperament of, a personality of. So you can either start with external behavior or internal behavior directly. But make sure you have at least three possibilities. Each of those have to have three different, if you would, behaviors you can see in reality. 
that connection between the interpretation and the behavioral level will absolutely give you more insight. Insight in what way? Well, the suggestion that at least I offer whenever I do a program is that I'm not trying to do solutions for you. I'm trying to give you sanity. You can predict what is likely to happen before it happens. Your ability to predict is very high, which means that life is not a surprise. When life is not a surprise, what a difference that makes. Now, if you would, take a moment and on a piece of paper, go back and write down what you saw here a second ago. Just to show you one more time. So on a piece of paper, think of any behavior you want. Write it down. Make sure you get three possible interpretations. This can be something that you did or someone else did. Make sure you do three different behaviors that could come from each one of those. Take about three or four minutes and then I'll rejoin you at the end of the time period and we'll see if anyone has any comments they want to make. See you in about three to four minutes. So we had a participant 
So we had a participant that um, wrote in, uh, if I'm having a bad morning, how can I interpret it? So let's go back here. Uh, bad morning. Uh, let's presume that um, not as much energy, can't concentrate as well, and uh, reaction to what is going on uh, throughout the morning is more uh, negative than positive. Possibilities. Why might I be having a bad morning? Well, one of them could be I didn't sleep well last night. Another one could be that uh, something happened before I got to work uh, that wasn't uh, very positive. And then it could be that uh, when I got to work, something was going on that uh, wasn't very positive. So let's take these three. If we have, as our first interpretation, didn't sleep well last night, if that's true, then the behavior that we would see is that if I sleep well on most nights, if the next day I'm having a, a good day, then we can say that, yeah, maybe the uh, reason why I had that bad morning, that particular morning, was because I didn't sleep well. The next possibility is to say, okay, what about if I had something that uh, went wrong at home? Uh, and it could be anything from, you know, uh, an accident with material around the house. Uh, I, the other morning, <laughs> was filling up the dog water bucket and the sink. And I thought, well, it's safe for me to just walk away and the bucket would fill up and everything would be fine. But what I didn't realize was the bucket actually was over the um, hole that drained the water out. So when the water filled out of the bucket, it went, out, started filling up the sink and actually went on the floor. So sometimes when we say having a bad morning at home, it may not be people, it may be circumstance in terms of what's going on. If that was true, that the reason why I'm having a bad morning is because of something that happened at home, then again, what happened uh, on the days when I come to work and everything is fine at home, would mean that the next behavior I would see in reality is that I'd be doing fine. Let's go to the third possibility. I get to work and there's something that uh, didn't go right right away. And uh, if that's so, then the behavior I would see would be based just on what is going on uh, at work. We all know, we've all experienced, what happens if you don't get a good night's sleep, if something at home doesn't go well, and then you get to work and that doesn't go well either. Those are the tough mornings. The interpretation, if we were watching someone else um, instead of ourselves, is a little bit different because with ourselves, we can actually ask ourselves these three questions. If it's someone else, we may not have permission to really ask those questions. So then we'd only have to perhaps have the... Uh, option of watching their behaviors at work. So thank you for that question that we had. Now, we want to uh, end our program with uh, some other material for you to look at. And it's especially helpful if we uh, talk about what wisdom is and a possible reason why you may want to um, attend the camp for whatever reason. These are pre-recorded uh, footage and they're both about, um, one is between the two of them, it's gonna be about uh, three minutes long. Here's the first one. It's based on uh, one of my favorite statues. It's called Reflections. Michael Grinder here talking some more about perception. We uh, say the perception is what you see and hear, how you bring it into your brain, and then how you interpret what you saw and heard. We're going to suggest that with age, we usually get better, not always, but we usually get better in terms of interpreting more accurately what we see and hear. This statue here is a representation of it. And ignoring the, stat the uh, shadow of it, you see a boy and a dog, and that indicates youth. And then as we spin it around, listen to the Lazy Susan help us. 
we see the same human being and dog now as an older person. I certainly qualify for that. And the person is now reflecting in terms of what life was. We know that from brain research that in our brain we have dendrites. And for some reason, for certain people after 50 years old, instead of having two dendrites that are connecting with two other dendrites, and therefore you have synapses and if you want to call it interplay, for some reason, for some people after 55, they get a third one. And that's what they think is wisdom. It's not just the information, it's the interpretation of the information. So you can wait until you're old and, and get very good at your perception, or you can accelerate your development of your perception by attending a camp that explains what do you see and what do you hear and how do you interpret it. Michael Grinder, Perception. Well, we're coming to the close of our webinar in terms of understanding the individual. It's one of our three perceptual levels that we have. And we're going to end on the advantages of attending besides the last footage we had, which was, hey, why wait until you get old to be wise? You can be wise uh, when you're young. And of course, the uh, research also indicates that just because you get old doesn't mean you get wise. In fact, most of us, including myself, have a tendency that as you get old, you only go with Y1 and you don't go with Y2 and Y3. And so you get sloppy in terms of everything you see is interpreted a given way. This is our uh, last of our pre-recorded. And then in just a second, we'll um, go off with a, a very nice set of music that I think you're going to like. Advantages of attending the perception camp. Michael Grinder here talking some more about perception. In previous snippets, we talked about the advantage of make sure that you see and hear and know how to interpret correctly whatever your perception is. Now the question is, what is the advantage of attending a perception camp? It's because you're with other people. And instead of trying to carve out your own professional development, why don't you be next to someone who's also carving their own professional development? This perception camp of five days, you're going to be with other people, like-minded. You're going to form relationships that will last after the perception camp. In fact, several people, they're making sure they bring someone with them that's in their professional world. Colleague, friend, what a difference it makes. Michael Grinder here. We know that your time is precious. You make sure that you give us that time and we'll use it wisely for you. Perception. See you there. The webinar that you've uh, just watched uh, will be on our website, michaelgrinder.com. It will also be on YouTube. And in Australia, we'll try to have it up on Positive Persuasion. In the month of August, we will have our next um, program on the webinar. And at that time, we're going to focus on two people in terms of who's likely to dominate. We'll be using our book, Charisma, The Art of Relationship which are high focus on cats and dogs. And we end on this particular screen.